السلام علیکم ویلکم ٹو ورچوئل یونیورسٹی ان ٹوڈیز لیسن ٹوڈیز لیسن لائک یور پریویس لیسن ول بی ان ٹو پارٹس وی ول بگن بائی لکنگ ایٹ ہاؤ فکشن رائٹرس دے برنگ دیئر کیریکٹرس ٹو لائف بائی امپلائنگ ڈفرینٹ ٹیکنیکس اینڈ ون آف دیز ٹیکنیکس از ڈسکرپشن اینڈ دا سیکنڈ ہاف آف دا لیسن we will go back to practical texts which are related to your field of studies which is computers almost every example of imaginative writing deals with people in some way or the other and we are today we are going to look at some of the ways in which a writer is able to translate his vision of the people he is writing about and transfer it to the people who are going to read and he does it through his words now in some ways a painter or a photographer they have an easier task because they are able to present their ideas directly in visual terms though of course uh, though of course interpretation is necessary here too you have to interpret in every way in it uh, now how does an author achieve the same effect by using only words your painter or your photographer does it in another way your author does it through words now there are six ways in which a writer can create the same effect and he does it number one through action he shows his characters in action they are doing something number two he can use words he can put words in his character's mouth and it is from those words that you form an opinion or a picture of the character number 3 the uh, the writer can make a direct statement and number 4 the writer can compare and associate with other things and in that way he can help you form a picture and number 5 the writer can associate one particular point of view or action by which the character can easily and quickly be identified and number 6 he can choose words and it is his choice of words he that he picks out a particular feature or detail that recalls that character vividly to mind now we will look at the first one in action one of the ways a writer does this is by showing the character performing some action which is typical of him or performing an action which in a particular way uh, performs an action in a particular way that reveals the kind of person he is and if you read stories you will notice that this is a very common way that writers use uh, i wonder if you have read the story by charles dickens it's called great expectations and uh, the writer gives a description of mrs gargery who is pip's sister and if you notice the way he describes mrs gargery's action she is cutting bread and the way the writer charles dickens describe uh, the way he describes the cutting of the bread somehow associates with the character of mrs gargery when you read 
the description, you form a picture of the lady. And the words are, My sister had a trenchant way of cutting our bread and butter for us that never varied. First, with her left hand, she jammed the loaf hard and fast against her bib. A bib is a piece of cloth that one wears over one's clothes so that your uh, clothes don't get dirty. First, with her left hand, she jammed the loaf hard and fast against her bib where it sometimes got a pin into it and sometimes a needle, which we afterwards got into our mouths. Then she took some butter, not too much, on a knife and spread it on the loaf in an apothecary, apothecary kind of fashion. Now, apothecary is an old word for the medicine man. As if she were making a plaster using both sides of the knife with a slapping dexterity. This is the way she went about putting butter, applying butter on the loaf and trimming and molding the butter off the crest. Then she gave the knife a final smart wipe on the edge of the plaster and then sawed a very thick round off the loaf which she finally, before separating from the loaf, hewed into two halves of which Joe got one and I the other. Now this is a simple description of a lady cutting a loaf of bread and she gives one piece to her husband and the other to her brother, Pip. But notice the way this is described. It brings a vivid picture of this lady, Mrs. Gargari, there she is, he says, he jams, she jams the uh, bread onto the table, pushes it down, then she uses the knife to cut it and after she's cut it, she applies butter to it, not too heavy, not too thick, just slightly and then she wipes off all the extra butter and she hews, the word that is used is hew, hew is to cut and she cuts the bread, the loaf, into two halves. Now, what does this account of Mrs. Gargari cutting the bread tell us about her? It is the words that the writer uses. In these words lies the picture. Words like trenchant, jammed, slapping dexterity, a final smart wipe. And then he uses words like sword and hewed. These are words that one uses for cutting wood. And you get a picture of a well-built lady cutting as if she is cutting a piece of wood, you know. Actually, she is cutting a loaf of bread. Now, write your answer to these and the following questions in your notebook. It will be good practice. What is the impression that the use of words like trenchant, jammed, slapping dexterity, a final smart wipe, sword, hewed, what do these, what kind of impression is built up? Now that was how a writer shows action through his choice of words. Now the second technique is, and that is, through speech. And in this way, the writer can indicate character through the words that he puts into his character's mouth. Now, this is, of course, an important, in fact, the most important element of the, of the dramatist. Drama writers, this is their craft. It's the words that they put into their characters' mouths that tells you what kind of a character is being described, what kind of character the writer has in mind. And it reveals the characters through their speech. Uh, it's not only dramatists who use this technique. Other writers, novelists, short story writers, 
they also use this technique. Now, I will read out a short extract from another novel. It is by P. G. Woodhouse and the name of the novel is Thank You Jeeves. You have come across it last time in your, uh, in your previous lesson. This is a conversation taking place between the master and Jeeves. Jeeves is the servant, a very close confidant of the master. Notice the conversation, how it takes place. Jeeves, I said, do you know what? No, sir. No, sir. Do you know what I saw last night? No, sir. J. Washman Stoker and his daughter Pauline. Indeed, sir. Awkward. What? Uh, I can conceive that after what occurred in New York, it might be distressing for you to encounter Miss Stokes, sir. But I fancy the contingency need scarcely arise. I wait this. When you, talk, when you start talking about contingencies arising, Jeeves, the brain seems to flicker and I rather miss the gist. Do you mean I ought to be able to keep out of her way? Yes, sir. Avoid her? Yes, sir. Now, if you look at Jeeves' answers, Apart from one speech that is a bit, uh, he says uh, a few sentences, the rest of his speech is very, very economical. That is, few words. He's a man of few words. It is either yes, sir, no, sir, yes, sir, no, sir. Now, what can we learn about Jeeves? What kind of a person is he from the words that the writer puts in his mouth? What can we deduce about the kind of person Jeeves is and his attitude towards his master from the economy of his speech, from what Jeeves actually says and what is implied? Now, write down on your, in your notebook what you think the writer has in mind. Anything, it's your opinion. Now, the third way, the third technique is by making direct statement. Some writers tell us about their characters directly instead of showing them and allowing us to draw our own conclusions. Writers build detail on detail until we have a clear picture of their appearance, their habits, their opinions, their life history. Now you will see on your screen an account of a character called Miss Arkwright. Miss Arkwright. I shall read it out and you read silently and you notice the, kind, the kinds of words that are used to describe Miss Arkwright and a picture will form in your mind about this character. She was in no way a remarkable person. Her appearance was not particularly distinguished and yet she was without any feature that could actively displease. She had enough personal eccentricities to fit into the pattern of English village life, but none so absurd or antisocial that they could embarrass or even arouse gossip beyond what was pleasant to her neighbors. She accepted her position as an old maid with that cheerful good humor and occasional irony which are essential to English spinsters since the deification of Jane Austen, or more sacredly, Miss Austen, by the upper middle classes. She attempted to counteract the inadequacy of the unmarried state by quiet, sensible, and tolerant, tolerant social work in the local community. She was liked by nearly everyone, though she was not afraid of making enemies where she knew that her broad but deeply felt religious principles were being opposed. Any socially pretentious or undesirably extravagant conduct, too, was liable 
to call for to call from her an unexpectedly caustic and well aimed snub she was invited everywhere and always accepted the invitations you could see her at every tea party quietly but well dressed with one or two very fine old pieces of jewelry that had come down to her from her grandmother she would pass from one group to another laughing or serious as the occasion demanded she listened with patience but with a slight twinkle in her eye to mr hodson's endless stories of life in dar es salaam or myra hops breathless accounts of her latest system of diet john hobday in his somewhat ostentatiously gentleman farmer attire would describe his next novel about east anglian life to her to her before even his beloved daughter had heard of it richard trelawney just down from oxford found that she had read and really knew dunn's sermons yet she could swap detective stories with colonel wright by the hour and was his main source for quotations when the times crossword was in question it was she who incorporated little mrs grantham into village life when that underbred suburban woman came there as colonel grantham's second wife checking her vulgar remarks about the lower classes with kindly humor but defending her against the formidable battery of lady vernon's antagonism yet she it was also who was first at lady vernon's when sir robert had his stroke and her unobtrusive kindliness and real services gained her a singular position behind the grim reserve of the vernon family she could always banter the vicar away from his hobby horse of the greek right when at parish meetings the agenda seemed to have been buried forever beneath a welter of eucologia and menenia uh, sorry and menenia she checked sir robert's anti bolshevik phobia from victimizing the county librarian for her fabianism but was fierce in her attack on the local council when she thought that class prejudice had prevented commander osborn's widow from getting council house she led in fact an active and useful existence yet when anyone praised her she would only laugh my dear she would say hard works the only excuse old maids like me have got for existing at all and even then i don't know that they oughtn't to lethalize the lot of us as the danger of war grew nearer in the 30s her favorite remark was well if they've got any sense this time they'll keep the young fellows at home and put us useless old maids in the trenches and she said it with real conviction now that was a fairly long a fairly long passage and uh read it again read it a couple of times it is very very english you don't have to bother about it just read the text and see what kind of picture you get in your mind about miss arkwright's character we know one thing she is an old uh, she is not married she lives in a village and she is very active so just jot down in your notebook what kind of picture you got when you read the text now that was the third technique the fourth technique is by using comparison and associations sometimes writers tell us about their characters by comparing them to something else which calls up an image in our minds or by associating them with some idea or object that is related 
or that is significant. You, uh, maybe you are familiar with Miss Murdstone. Uh, she is a character from Charles Dickens' novel, David Copperfield. And um, see what kind of picture uh, comes into your mind when you read her name and her description. You will notice a few things. You will notice that Charles Dickens uses some words again and again so that an association is built in your mind with Miss Murdstone. Now here is a description of Miss Murdstone. It was Miss Murdstone who was who arrived. A gloomy looking lady she was, dark like her brother, whom she greatly resembled in face and voice, and with very heavy eyebrows nearly meeting over her large nose, as if being disabled by the wrongs of from wearing whiskers, she had carried them to that account. She brought with her two uncompromising hard black boxes with her initials on the lids in hard brass nails. When she paid the coachman, she took the money from a hard steel purse and she kept the purse in a very jail of a bag which hung upon her arm by a heavy chain and shut up like a bite. I had never at that time seen such a metallic lady altogether. I had never at that time seen such a metallic lady altogether as Miss, as Miss Murdstone was. Now read the passage again. It's a shorter passage and you pick out the words or objects, words and objects that directly suggest metal. Which words in the description of Miss Murdstone suggest characteristics of metal? How is this association with metal appropriate? And look at the lady's name, Murdstone. What kind of picture comes into your mind? Now the fifth technique that writers employ is that of associating the character with one particular point of view or action by which they can easily and quickly be identified. Now there's another short description of a character from the same novel, Uriah Heep. If you haven't read this novel so far, see if you can get hold of a copy and read David Copperfield. That's the name of the novel and the writer is Charles Dickens. There is this description of Uriah Heep. And if you read the description, you will notice that there are certain words that have been used and long after you've read the novel, you will remember, you will associate Uriah Heep with certain words. Uh, there is a phrase, ever so humble, ever so humble. And this gentleman, Uriah Heep, he keeps rubbing his hands all the time and he keeps using the phrase, he uses the phrase, ever so humble, again and again, with the result that they are associated with him forever. Now I'll read this and you notice these words. It was no fancy of a mine about his hands, I observed, for he frequently ground the palms against each other as if to squeeze them dry and warm, besides often wiping them in a stealthy way on his pocket handkerchief. Now there is another description. I'm reading out these descriptions for you to notice how writers use words to associate 
how they use certain words which form an association in your mind whenever that character whenever you read about that character whenever you think about that character there is another character from a book called hard times again written by charles dickens and it is mr thomas gradgrind gradgrind a name thomas gradgrind a man of realities a man of facts and calculations a man who proceeds upon the principle that two and two are four and nothing over and who is not to be talked into allowing for anything more thomas gradgrind sir peremptorily thomas thomas gradgrind with a rule and a pair of scales and the multiplication table always in his pocket sir ready to weight and measure any parcel of human nature and to tell you exactly what it comes to it is a mere question of figures a case of simple arithmetic get some other nonsensical belief into the head of george gradgrind or augustus gradgrind or john gradgrind or joseph gradgrind all suppositions non-existent persons but into the head of thomas gradgrind no sir now underline the words that reinforce the idea that thomas gradgrind is a man of facts and calculations and what is the use of the word sir what does the use of the word sir add to the passage read it a number of times and just see what kind of picture you get in your mind and the last technique that i shall discuss today is the choice of words and picking out a particular feature or detail that calls the character vividly to mind now this is from a novel by edward blishens a cack handed war he was a tiny fellow with a leathery white face and a black hair and tied to the case he brought were the most enormous gum boots i'd ever seen mrs goss was a widow a neat little woman of over 70 and witch like he was a deeply depressed man this farmer who always wore a white coat and cloth cap and was always peppered with a white and black bristle he was a tall silent dark man very gentle he who would talk over his machine as if it was some moody woman on the straw stack was a boy a short stout boy with a kind of naked pertness about his eyes and a very runny nose now notice that these are descriptions of five characters the writer has described five characters each one different and when you read you notice that for each one you have a different picture in your mind now try to make them alive by the way you see the words by by the way he has used the words notice he gives each one a particular descriptive detail a detail that defines the character him or her clearly and individually read these character five again and see how they have been described by the writer now that was the first half of our lesson in which we talked about fiction writers using different techniques to show their characters now we shall look at factual texts and texts that are related to computers 
In this part of the lesson, the second half, we are going to look at examples, giving examples, how you use examples to explain a point or to illustrate an idea that is commonly used. Now, in texts, when the primary uh, objective is to teach the order about some subjects, it is important to differentiate between the idea or ideas presented and the illustration of the idea with examples. Writers often use, often say explicitly or very clearly which things are examples, right? They use connectives and you will see a few connectives in the table. It is words like for example, examples of, for instance, instances of, exemplifies, an example of this, cases of, shows, as an example, illustration of, illustrates, that is, exemplified by, a second or third, such as, illustrated by, like, seen in, namely. These were all the words that I have read. They were all words used by a writer to show, to indicate that he is going to illustrate, that he is going to give you an example. First he stated something, now he is giving you an example. Look at these sample sentences. You have a few sample sentences on your screen. Look at them and notice the words that are used to illustrate. The switches, number one, the switches like the cores are capable of being in one of two possible states, that is on or off, magnetized or unmagnetized. It's the phrase that is, that is over here a signal for you that the writer is illustrating. He is going to give you an example. So instead of using the word example, he has used the phrase that is. Number two, computers have circuits for performing arithmetic operations such as addition, subtraction, division, multiplication and exponentiation. Now here, it is the phrase such as. Such as is, is an indicator to you that he is going to illustrate, the writer is going to illustrate with an example. Number three, the computer can only decide three things, namely, is one number less than another? Are two numbers equal? And is one number greater than another? And in this sentence, it was the word namely. The word namely signified was a signal for the reader that an example is following. Number four, computers can process information at extremely rapid rates. For example, they can solve certain arithmetic problems millions of times faster than a skilled mathematician. And here it is the phrase, for example. Here the writer has very clearly used the word, for example. Number five, using the very limited capabilities possessed by all computers, the task of producing a university payroll, for instance, can be done quite quickly. Here it's the phrase, for instance, which is used instead of the word, for example. For instance, tells you that he is going to give you, he has already given you an example. The very limited capable of by all computers, it is the of producing a university payroll can be done very quickly, easily. 
Now notice in this last example the marker follows the example. The example came earlier because the example is, is of producing a university payroll and the example came before and the writer used the marker for instance after using this. Now, all texts, all texts present examples explicitly. Some exemplifications are given implicitly, in which case, implicitly, not directly, in which case the above markers would not be used. Now, with this, we come to the end of today's lesson. In today's lesson, we have looked at how writers use characterization, how they use their characters in literary text to convey meaning, and how they show, how they bring their characters alive through the use of their words and how writers in non-fiction text, in factual text, in practical text, how they use illustrations and examples to make their writing more concrete and less abstract. In today's lesson, we looked at the different techniques that writers have at their disposal of creating live characters and uh, we looked at five, six techniques. Number one, just a recap of what we did today was the technique of action, of using action and we read an extract describing Mrs. Gargri from the novel Great Expectations. You uh, read about the lady cutting bread and it was through those actions that you associate that lady. It is that hard actions of hers, how she is, she is cutting bread but the way she is cutting bread it seems she is cutting wood. The second technique that we looked at was the way character writers put words into their characters mouths and we looked at the character of Jeeves in the novel Thank You Jeeves by Miss by P.G. Woodhouse and you notice that the writer uh, that uh, Jeeves has very little to say it is either yes or no yes sir no sir yes sir no sir and the third technique that writers use fiction writers use uh, is the, the technique of using direct statements and you had a long paragraph describing Miss Arkwright. She is a lady who's, who is not married, a lady who is very popular in her uh, sphere. She lives in a village and she leads a very active life. You will notice that she is very happily settled and she has a certain sense of humor. And you notice that the writer directly states these characteristics. You don't have to think very hard. It is through the words that are used by the writer but in a very direct, clear way. You can get a picture of this happily amiable, uh, well-settled old lady going about uh, the, her village where she lives. Number four, we looked at Miss Murdstone. We looked at a novel by Charles Dickens, David Copperfield, and the writer describes this character and he, he uses certain words which one begins to associate with this character and it was uh, it was words like steel and hard 
that, cup, that kept recurring again and again. So that was another way that the writer uses of bringing his characters to life. One can imagine Miss Murdstone, tall, dark lady, very harsh, very hard. Everything about her has a metallic ring. Miss Murdstone, her very name has a certain harsh quality about it. And the fifth technique that you learnt today was the technique of associating one particular point of view. And it was Mr. Gradgrind from a book, a novel by Charles Dickens. Um, the novel is Hard Times. And we get a picture of Mr. Gradgrind. He seems to be a man with, a very, with very fixed views. And notice how uh, the character is described. Grad grind. And it is, you associate facts with his name. All the time you have words like facts, factual. And then he, then notice how the writer uses so many other names. Augustus Grad grind. He says all these people are different. It is only Thomas Gradgrind who is of this particular point of view. And it is the point of view that is being associated with the name Gradgrind. You identify Gradgrind with a particular point of view. And then the last one. You notice that in this was a description of five different characters. And each character is described in a different way. There's a description of a little boy, a description of an old lady, a description of a farmer, five different characters are described for you and they come vividly to your mind. Now read those texts again. Maybe uh, the text about Miss Arkwright, it is fairly long. You will have to read it a couple of times. When you've read these five characters, uh, in fact uh, all these characters that have been described, in your notebook just jot down what comes into your mind, what kind of picture. And especially for number six, where the five characters are described, uh, you have a piece of homework. In your own way, in your own writing, describe five characters. Use certain words. Write those characters and you can phone in to our station and tell them. Read your, send us in your email the five characters. These characters can be anyone that you have seen in life. You've come across them. I'm sure you meet uh, lots of people daily. And this could be a, a short writing exercise. Just in a couple of words, in a couple of sentences, describe five characters. You don't have to uh, copy. Please do not copy from uh, the text that you have read. Keep it as a model. Use it as a model and create five characters. Uh, use at least two to three sentences for each character. And uh, send us emails and let us know how you have how you have fared and if possible we would like you to read David Copperfield and Hard Times. Dickens was a very popular writer uh, in Britain and he, even here in Pakistan people love to read 
uh, stories of Charles Dickens. He is very popular with our children. Uh, some of the characters, especially Mr. Uh, Miss Murdstone and Mr. Murdstone and Mr. Gradgrind, they are always, uh, children love to read about these characters. And uh, do write and let us know, send us emails if you can, uh, if you have any problems getting hold of these books, write to us and we will uh, see if we can give you addresses from where you can get these books. Uh, you get them in, um, you don't, if you can't read uh, the original text, which would be uh, excellent if you could read them, but there are in the market, uh, there are books, abridged versions available. So just read it for the sake of pleasure. You don't have to look up meanings. Even if you don't know the meanings, never mind. Just keep, keep on reading so that you begin to, uh, you will develop a fluency in reading. And it is only through uh, reading for pleasure that you develop fluency. And we hope to see, do write and let us know how you fare and see you. With that, we will wind up today's lecture. See you next time. Allah Hafiz.